Well, it already has lost 90 some percent of its power since since inception. So it's already in that camp. The question is, will it have will it continue to happen? Uh, I think just like any other fiat currency, it's going to devalue over time. Um, you know, whether or not you're comparing it to real assets or other currencies is, is kind of a separate topic. So you can have a declining dollar index. I mean, you can have a rising dollar index, yeah, you know, meaning it's strengthening versus other currencies at a time when all currencies are devaluing versus, say, gold or real estate or stocks or whatever the case may be. Um, my overall kind of base case is that in the next couple of years, we're probably going to enter a dollar bear cycle. Um, it's something I continue to monitor, though. I think that, you know, currency trends are not something that I want to stand in front of. It's kind of like standing in front of a freight train. So I want to see uh, price action start to roll over. Um, so it's something that I continue to monitor. Basically, there's a couple of key variables to watch. One is, things like rate differentials and quantitative tightening. So basically the things that the Fed can control. Um, and that's why a lot of people are dollar bullish right now because the Fed's kind of you know talking about being hawkish, at least relative to you know, say the ECB or the Bank of Japan, which are some of the big currency pairs. On the other hand, you know, it's also dictated by capital flows, right? So if, if the Fed's hawkishness puts pressure on the NASDAQ, there's so much capital uh, around the world kind of pouring into the NASDAQ, you know, pouring into U.S. tech stocks over the past several years. And if that capital decides to go into value, decides to go into other markets, um, you can get a dollar weakening period. Uh, and so I, I think overall, we're looking at a, a, a you know, somewhat more uh, weak dollar, um, it, you know, compared to say, I think it could take some pressure off of emerging markets. Um, but it's something I, I continue to watch for price confirmation. Um, and, and basically, when the, when the dollar kind of goes up sharply to the upside, you start to get indicators generally that the, the Fed might end up having to back off. I think a, a big surprise to the markets would be that if, if, if say, both Gareth and I are right, that the Fed is unable to get the, the hawkishness that they've described, right? If, if the economy continues to decelerate and they have to back off some of their tightening plans, you could get a, a big trend shift in the dollar as markets begin pricing that in uh, and potentially rotating capital elsewhere. Gareth, dollar devaluation yeah. down to zero. Could it happen? <laughs> I mean, I mean, anything can happen, right? And and I think I think Lynn's one hundred percent right that that the dollar should have a weakening period. Uh, this the way I would project it and forecast it out is is that the world is watching the Fed, right? So we have inflation how it is, and 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 if the Fed is unable to be as hawkish as she said, then it's going to send the signal out to the world that the Fed really has lost control, and they're never going to be able to be the tightening player in the room that keeps the dollar strong. And if you look at reserve currencies throughout history, whether it was, you know, France, France was the reserve currency hundreds of years ago, England was, and now the US since I think it was 1920, reserve currencies don't last a whole long time. I mean, 100 years, 110 years, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and so we're kind of approaching that at this point, getting to that point. And if you look at China, I, I've been saying this for the last year, ever since China introduced the digital yuan, the digital yuan, China is, is this belt and road long-term player they want the reserve currency of the world to be the digital yuan. They introduced it. They're going to start pushing it more and more. And I do think that at some point, if the Fed loses enough credibility, you will see investors flee the dollar. And eventually that will drive the price of the dollar down and pretty quickly and fast. Yeah. Perfect. One thing so worth pointing out, one thing worth pointing out is that in World War One and World War II, the UK went into that period as the global reserve currency. Uh, you had the rising power, which was the United States, and you had a similar dynamic where the world, you know, the the world currency, UK, they were running these structural trade deficits while the United States was running structural trade surpluses. Um, and you know, but after you had the event of those wars, and you had, you know, you had uh, all currencies devalue versus gold. The UK devalued uh, as much or more as many other currencies. So, for example, they they devalued more than the dollar. Uh, and so, being a world reserve currency, uh, when the regime shifts, does not prevent uh, protect you from uh, currency devaluations, just like other currencies. So, I guess people buying stable coins tied to the US dollar, tied to any well, potentially any currency. I mean, is, there, is that just a futile exercise for the long term? I guess the short term, you can farm yields. What's your take? Yeah. Well, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, for me, you know, the, the tethers of the world, I mean, it's great for transactions, right? But aside from that, I mean, you're basically holding something that's going to mirror the dollar. So, so as a long-term safety play, I don't, I don't see it as such. Uh, so I'm, I'm bullish on the proliferation of stable coins. I, 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 ever since January, 2021, I've been saying that that market's going to get a lot bigger. Uh, and it did go from something like, you know, 40 billion to like 140 billion in a year. Um, and I, I do think that market's going to get bigger over time. Um, there are use cases. So a lot of, I mean, there, so is, I'm not bullish on the dollar, but for example, if you were in Argentina or Venezuela or, or Turkey, the dollar is pretty attractive. Stable coins are, are attractive to a lot of emerging market, um, users. 
Um, and they are also serving as a unit of account for offshore cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, it used to be Bitcoin. Now they generally, now that they, with the invention of stable coins, they can use those. And so because I, I don't think the dollar is going to zero overnight, right? I don't think we're going to be here a year later and talk about how the, you know, the dollar is like, you know, done now, right? So I think this is going to be a long-term issue of just ongoing devaluation. And so I think that stable coins are going to play a role going forward. Um, but the, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're just as prone to devaluation as the underlying currency behind them. So I think that, you know, they can be a low volatility way of, of transferring and temporarily storing value, uh, but they're no substitute for things like Bitcoin or gold or, yeah. or hard assets in general. Perfect transition. We're going to ask about uh, gold now before we open the floor to the audience. So let's talk about precious metals for our last segment before we go to Q&A. Gareth, you have said that gold will be the best performer of 2022. I'd like to hear your rationale for this. So it's it's looking at a couple things. Number one, uh, being a technical chartist, that that's the chart is the first thing I go to, right? And you look at the chart. You had this mega run from 2018 uh, 18 in gold all the way to the highs in 2020, and since then you've stayed in the upper range. I mean, even though you know so many people have said, "Oh, gold does hasn't done anything; it's dead," but really, what it's doing is digesting that move from the lows of 2018 to 2020. So that digestion period is looking like it's coming to a close. We're borderline breakout, short-term breakout here on the chart. And I think, again, you have a situation where Bitcoin and cryptos are now entering a bear market. It makes them less attractive. I think money you know, in 2021 flowed away from from gold into cryptocurrencies because it was the hot place to go. Now people are starting to realize that at this stage of their existence, they're not really a protection against inflation or anything else. So I think that puts the onus back on gold to be a better performer. So again, between charts and just looking at what is going on, I think you have a very good bull case for gold. And overall, remember, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that gold will be the best performer, but to be the best performer when I'm thinking that the NASDAQ, S&P and Bitcoin are down for the year, it doesn't also say it has to do a whole lot, maybe even just stay here or go a little bit higher. But I ultimately do think it's at least going back to the 2020 highs and possibly as high as about 2600 by year end. Okay. Lynn, what's your view on gold? I'm pretty bullish on gold. Um, you know, for brief history, I I was I st turned bullish on gold in late 2018, early early 2019. Um, and uh, in my August 2020 newsletter, I got more near term cautious on it. I, I said basically I, my bullishness has shifted to Bitcoin in the near term, um, and that I was you know I think that that gold had played out the first part of its kind of run here, but I was still kind of long term bullish. Um, and then for full you know. Uh, in March 2021, I started to get bullish again, which was kind of a false start, right? So, I mean, analysts like to talk about their their wins. I mean, sometimes, it, you know, things don't work out the way I expected. So gold, uh, you know, I, I started to see signs of a breakout and instead it just kind of rolled back over and kept going sideways. So it didn't, didn't have like a breakdown either, just kind of continued its sideways trend. Uh, and then starting a couple of weeks ago, I started to see a second attempt here at a, at, a, at a gold breakout. And I think this one probably has more legs to it. Um, and you know, I'm starting to see it, it confirmed in price. And so, for example, you know, with a declining PMI, uh, you know, basically risk off of environment, gold kind of finally has its chance to kind of decouple from, from S&P 500 to the upside. Um, and so that combination of decelerating economy uh, and if the Fed indeed is unable to be as hawkish as is currently priced in, that could be a bullish catalyst for gold. Um, and so overall, I do think it's a, it's a positive risk reward here. In addition, we're seeing you know, just price confirmation, the S&P 500 priced in gold has been rolling over uh, and, and giving some pretty bullish signals in gold's favor. So I think that as a defensive play, as part of a portfolio, I am bullish on gold for 2022. Okay. If, if, if I could just jump in here too, there's, there's one other thing I'd like to mention about gold is uh, I love to compare gold with the inflation periods that we're in now versus the 70s and 80s. And what's fascinating is that in, in the early 70s, before that high, high inflation hit, gold had this beautiful run from about $50 to $175. And in 1975, when inflation was roaring in the US, gold actually had this period of consolidation that lasted one to two years. Now, by the late 70s, 77 or so, you started to have a mega move where gold went from about $100 all the way up to about 800 or so. So, so just keep in mind that, that a lot of people have said, well, you know, you have inflation at 8%. Why isn't gold ripping to the upside? Well, there, there's a certain amount of price action that it takes for for that metal to get the money flow to go in and start chasing it higher. And it's absolutely, in my opinion, replicating the, the price action from the 70s into the 80s. Perfect. I agree. And it's and it's hard to have gold rally a ton when other risk assets are rallying yeah. as too. Because you can say, well, why would I buy gold when I can just buy the S&P 500? That's going straight up too. Uh, and so it's really once the other things start to encounter weakness uh, that people can look around and say, well, what's doing well? 
And one of them is, I, I think, in this declining PMI environment is gold. Small ebook, big impact, the wealth tree, the only four ways that will make you financially free forever. Download it here for free. 